Let's do the math. Our service mission here was supposed to last 31 souls. For redundancy, they sent 68 souls worth of food. That's for six people. So for just me, that's going to last 300 souls, which I figure I can stretch to 400 if I ration. So I got to figure out a way to grow three years worth of food here on a planet where nothing grows. Luckily, I'm a botanist. Mars will come to fear my botany powers. And that's a clip from The Martian, and I'm delighted to say that Sir Ridley Scott uh, joins us again on the program. Sir Ridley, good afternoon. Good afternoon. A uh, nice afternoon it is. Yes, how do we find you today, sir? Um, I think pretty well, pretty good. Um, you know, glad to be in London, briefly. And I've been looking. Always look glad to be here. Yes, yeah, so we've been looking forward to talking about the Martian. Looking forward to having you on the show again. Because I was first alerted to this story when my—I mean, your teenagers often tell you stuff before you're aware of it. My, my teenage mm -hmm. son was reading the Martian and declared it to be, and I quote, the greatest book that he's ever read. Uh, really? And and from oh. from then, as I've, I've followed the story uh, most excitedly. When did you first get on board this story? When did you first hear about the Martian? Well, Fox sent it to me in saying that um, I was prepping actually what is going to be called Alien Paradise Lost, um, which I'm now doing in February, and they interrupted that process by giving me the script from Drew Goddard, and I read the script and was kind of knocked out. I really loved it, and from that, met with Drew, learnt about the book, looked at the book, but I, I was already on board. I, I just wanted to do it, so I was very very taken with the whole context. I love the complexity of the, the tale, the narrative, and the science of it all. But, and then also the humor. So I, 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 even on first read, I thought it was pretty humorous. Yeah. It must, I was thinking it must have been something quite extraordinary, really, to get you, because if you're already sort of poised to do Alien Paradise Lost, and you're thinking, no, I'm gonna wait, because I want to do The Martian. I mean, that must have been an extraordinary screenplay that you were saying. Uh, yeah, it was. It's an extraordinary screen. I was struggling a bit with trying to get the script right as well, so in a way it was in the nick of time. Andy Weir has said, the guy who wrote The Martian, it, it was a technical book for technical people, and it was loaded with science and maths. He had no real idea that it would have mainstream appeal. I mean, he sounds really surprised uh, that what, yeah. the, what, what this story has done. Well, I think it was Drew Goddard said he felt at the end of the day it was a love letter to science, which is kind of a nice way of putting it. Uh, because science saves his life, saves his yeah. ass. And I think, but of course he's an astronaut, so he's actually what he's trained to do. But I think it enabled him to go and really do a very detailed essay of just what it would be like to, you know, pull yourself together and survive, like on such a, you know, God-forbidden place, you know? Was it... Was it um, uh always an issue to try and work out how much science that you could put in, because you're right, I mean, he is a botanist, and he says he's the world's greatest yeah. botanist, or certainly the best botanist on the planet, uh, as to how you could incorporate all that science into, a, into an exciting movie. Um, I couldn't have, uh, be, but I'm not a writer, but I'm pretty good at distilling uh, stuff, um, and I think it would take way too long for me to write something. I do write and overwrite and trim things and adjust things all, always. But to start from scratch, I haven't got the patience, particularly on something so detailed as that. And it's not just a straight adaptation, very often adapting a screenplay from a good piece of, a good piece of literature, a good book is, is tricky, because partly down to how do you sustain the, you know, the step-by-step -step process of the dynamics of the book that you enjoy uh, without losing it by reducing it to 120 pages. Can you, and can you just explain, just for the purposes of people who are unaware of the book and unaware of the story, how it is that Matt Damon, as our, as our botanist, gets stranded on Mars in the first place? Well, uh, let's assume it's 2023, 2024. They're up there on the first mission up to Mars, and they're destined to spend a month to 28 days, 30 days there, and then they have to leave because they'll run out of time and, and timing because it's a nine-month trip there and a nine-month trip back. So it's time to leave. In so doing, they are warned by Houston uh, that actually there's a storm coming in which is untoward and could easily upset the balance of the MAV vehicle, which is the evacuation vehicle, 
which would take them up to join the mothership, which is orbiting Mars at that particular moment, has sat there for a month waiting for them to come back. And so they have to leave. In leaving, uh, Mark Watney is believed to be killed uh, by being hit by a, a piece of debris that flies off one of the radio uh, antennae and kills him. And from that, they have to leave, and they leave him behind. That's how he gets left behind. So and that starts there. Yeah, and, and, and the storm uh, that you've just described uh, sounds a really... I mean, for the actors, uh, it sounds like a pretty scary thing to have been in. Uh, in I mean, no, they're acting, and they know that all the safety precautions are there, and so, but it still sounds quite a scary storm that you built for them. Well, that's my job. I try and create a proscenium around the actors as close as they're going to get to the real thing. That's why I don't love green screen because the actor has, is having to react to green screen as opposed to something that's actually occurring around him or them. And I like to, I like to put them in on the spot. I think they like to be on the spot as well. And I think it's probably worth mentioning because there's been some press about the mm. fact that there wouldn't have been a storm on like this on Mars. That Andy Weir, I think the guy who wrote the book, he's, he's, he allowed himself the luxury of the storm because he thought it was pretty cool. So I think that's, I think that's fine, yeah, for the I mean, we, yeah, fine for the rest of us, I've, really. I got that early on from NASA. who said, well, there wouldn't be a storm like that because you've got no atmosphere there. So you wouldn't experience 180. Right now, we are experiencing 200K storms it mainly happens around Japan and the Far East. Um, you wouldn't get that on Mars. But if we didn't have it, I'd have to think of some other way that they were obliged to leave. And I, so I said over to you, Andy, or Drew, and they said, well, yeah, they came up with some <laughs> solutions which didn't really, they weren't as good as a storm. And NASA said, "What? whatever, okay, you know, we'll swallow this one. So a, sto a storm it is. On the, on the NASA um uh, collaboration. There's, there's some uh, there's some new technology uh, that I think has never been involved in a film before, and I've written down here nuclear powered ion plasma propulsion engine. Uh, am I right in that? And that, oh. has, that hasn't been in a movie before. Um, well, I think they're just a bit more powerful. They're air thrusters, they're air pushers, and because those propellers look formidable, but honestly, they're not really m very effective beyond about ten or twelve feet. And so you've always got to help with the power of the wind. Uh, so those, those were new, that was new technology, yeah. Helped a bit, but I still had to, what I now learned to do is each act, let's say there's six actors, or mm. was it six or five or six, each one has a tether with a thin wire and behind them they're fundamentally pulling along a person completely dressed in black so he disappears into the gloom and they are tugging them and pulling them back randomly throughout their movement forward. So it means that the actor can be seen to leaning at an untoward angle into the wind. So it's helped by balancing with somebody who's fundamentally an anchor coming behind them. That's what I learned to do. Yeah. One of the, one of the th many things I enjoyed particularly about the movie was the fact there aren't really any bad guys. And I think in, in, in other versions of this story, other people might have made Jeff Daniels' character as the NASA boss, might have turned him into um, you know, a shark-denying sheriff and said, no, no, we've got to keep the story uh, secret. Yeah. But, but you, didn't, you didn't play it like that. And I thought that was fantastic, the fact that all of, they're all of NASA, they're all kind of there's disagreements and there's arguments, of course, but they're all kind of on the same side. Well, I think that's what NASA were really thrilled with, that also... The, you know, the, the, the combination, the partnership between JPL and NASA doesn't always happen like that. But when there's a human life at risk, they all come together. That's why I thought even the inclusion of the Chinese uh, authority, you know, equivalent of NASA mm. in China was a good thing. To, it was a healthy thing to bring to bear into the fact that if a catastrophe did happen like that, I think all the space agencies would join together and help. Have you ever done um, a movie as dramatic as this with as much comedy? Because uh, the wise-cracking Matt Damon is, 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 is very much... To, I mean, there are loads of jokes. Uh, Thelma and Louise? Yes. That's yeah. I don't think everyone expected that to be quite so comedic. I always thought it was going to be quite funny because I thought the women were great and they were f amusing and it showed men to be a bunch of, you know, schoolboy jokes that we are. And I've always, I've never argued about that when I know we are. 
and therefore I always thought there was a lot of comedy that lying in there. I not just think, really I, not. I, I wonder if a lot of people will be, will be surprised by the amount of laughs that you have, I mean, and, and added to by the extraordinary seventies disco soundtrack, uh, which yeah. is which is fantastic. But a real, a re, another, again, a real surprise. Yeah, the disco soundtrack was in the book, and I thought it's not necessarily my favourite. Well, Bowie is always there. Um, I nearly said Jimi Hendrix. Bowie is always there. Um, and I have to say I really liked ABBA. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, it's, I think it's a secret. Everyone likes ABBA, really. I'm looking around this room now. I think they all like ABBA, really. Um, they even get their and, album, uh, their album cover shown. You know, this is it, which is yeah. extraordinary. But I, it, we just trusted to the choice in the book, and actually, it kind of worked because it's carefully chosen in, in line with the comedy of the situation. I, I saw it, it just worked. It was great. Uh, in in the book, there are a lot of uh, diary entries made by uh, Matt Damon's character, which we see as you know he's looking into the camera. And I just wonder whether that was. It's quite unusual for. Uh, I mean, obviously there are lots of people on set, but for an for an actor to be effectively acting alone is quite mm -hmm. a challenge, isn't it? E not really. I mean, I mean, both Matt and I knew that he's probably in. I don't know. I've never counted the percentage, but probably in half the film or more. And he just said to me, like I was thinking, we were both thinking, this is a lot of voiceover. We've got to find solutions for intonation to enjoy and and also get the humour coming out of the voiceover. Uh, and therefore, we put up the, you know what a GoPro is, camera? Yes. The, in the living space, there's about 30 GoPros everywhere, four in the living room, you know, three in the bathroom, uh, in the living quarters, in the bunk, everywhere. Everywhere he is, he's got someone to talk to. So eventually that GoPro became like a buddy, like a, mm. a friend. So suddenly his intonation would adjust as if you were talking to a person. Even in his, uh, tra I know he said tractor, even in his vehicle. And then the one camera really is like Captain Kirk. It's like doing ship's log, yeah? Day 130. Um, here I am, blah, blah, blah. And he talks to the camera, so it becomes more formal. But in there, he still drops comedic touches where he says at the very beginning, this and this and this can happen, that can happen, and the worst scenario, I'm going to run out of food or water or air. And he said, but here I'm still alive. And then he goes, surprise, okay. By saying surprise, I mean, that's really charming and quite funny, yeah, okay. Sir. I think from the moment at the very beginning, can I swear on radio? Or you well, if, well it depends what the swear word is and if it's too bad. Well, it's a bad me. one. When he says, you bleep me. So when he says, digs metal out of his stomach and goes, <laughs> and that was the key. At that moment, everybody, I'm hoping, will laugh because yeah, it's an right. understatement <laughs> with right. the position he's in. And so we got away with two of those during the film because they're all legitimate. The other one was you, <laughs> Mars. So I, I thought that was great. Really, just before you leave us, I have a couple of listeners' questions. Um, Phil mm -hmm. Hood sent this question in. Trailers are often criticised for giving too much of the film away, and Prometheus is sometimes cited as an example of this. What is your take on trailers? Um, trailers are to get bums on seats. Is, is bum bleepable as well? Uh, no, no, I it's think bum's get, fine. OK, it's to get butts on seats. If you don't get butts on seats, you have no business. Um, it's always an art against commerce, and I struggle with both, although I'm usually pretty successful. But sometimes, uh, you know, art does come to bear into it. But I'm out of advertising, and so I've really got a pretty close hand on my advertising in any film I do. I was particularly present in uh, this film because I wanted just to see just so much but if you go and see the movie, I think the movie's got way more than anything that Avatar can, can give you. So it's purely, it's a, it's a teaser. Literally, it's a titillation, it's a teaser. Tom Maybe has asked this question. Uh, Sir Ridley, you've worked in most genres in the past with one bigger mission, I think. Will we ever see a Ridley Scott-directed out-and-out comedy? Um, well, I thought Thumb and, Th Thumb and was a pretty out-and-out -out comedy, uh, apart from... The end, which I just thought was more, more more emotional than tragic, 
I think Matchstick Men, which I really liked doing with Nick Cage, I thought was really good. And I think A, a Good Year was, I thought it was pretty comedic. I liked that. So I liked them both. Well, uh, Sir Ridley, thank you very much indeed for speaking to us. Do you get back to Alien Paradise Lost at some stage, or are you off course with that? Or It's happening It's happening February. I've already begun pre-production. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll look forward cool. to, to speaking about that one. Uh, Sir Ridley, thank you very much indeed for talking to us today. Thank you.